Howdy, friends and neighbors. Welcome to the weekly assembly of the Oklahoma Conservative Political Action Church. I want to remind you all to turn off your cell phones, please, at this time. If your cell phone rings during the meeting, we expect a donation to this fellowship. Cat, is your ringer off? Russell, is your ringer off? Turn your... Oh, leave it on. Very good. Okay, so at this time, if everyone would please stand. Bob Lynn's going to lead us in opening prayer. Jimmy will lead the flag salute. Here's the flag for those that do that. Father, we come before you today in the name of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator, our Savior, our Master, and Lord. We just pray, Father, for the extension of your kingdom on the earth. We pray that you would bless your church, bless your pulpits. And uh, may your spirit move among our people, among the people on on the earth. We pray in particular, Lord, for uh, Oklahoma and uh, the elections going on currently and uh, for the condition of our uh, legislative leadership, of our governor. And, Father, we pray that you would give us godly leadership in this state, men who have biblical roots and to understand why they're here and why they're passing legislation. Father, we we repent of uh, the murder of thousands of uh, innocent women and children uh, that we have murdered in the womb. And we pray that you would give us men who would lead us away from this. We pray that you'd bless this meeting, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This organization is full of a lot of rich traditions. It's traditions that bind us together, that bring us together, that give us comfort in where we're going together. And so it's wonderful that we always begin in prayer. And then we have announcements. And then we talk about what's going on. And then we have a speaker. It's something we can look forward to every week. And I certainly do. So at this time, how about announcements? What's going on? Well, I guess the biggest announcement is that the legislature adjourned and went home. On the one hand, that's great, because the more days they're up there, the more mess they make out of everything. On the other hand, they left without their job done. They say it's done, and they did it all wrong. There's a lot of folks calling for a reformation change of the United States Constitution, because they think if we change that Constitution, that will all of a sudden fix things, and Congress will behave itself. And of course, we make the point over and over again that changing the Constitution doesn't make them obey it, and they have already shredded it. Well, the same thing has happened right here in the state of Oklahoma. We have a Constitution that says the budget will be balanced. What money you take in, you can spend. They ignore it every year, and again this year they passed in the budget more bonded indebtedness. That's not a balanced budget. Deficit spending and borrowing is not a balanced budget. They just violate the Constitution. Our Constitution says you can't raise taxes without a vote of 75% of the House and the Senate. And they did that to us this year anyway. And then, of course, they called one tax a fee so that they could get around the five-day deadline. So on the last day before they go on vacation, they could pass an unconstitutional tax. But, of course, I've written all about that in the weekly update. So we're in bad shape. I don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's a huge mess. I have really withheld judgment. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have not said very much negative about Speaker McCall or the House leadership this session because they were all new. And I didn't know which way they were going to go. And week after week, I would give them the benefit of the doubt. And week after week, they would end up with egg on their faces. And now they're doing completely immoral, unconstitutional, unlawful things. I think it's time we can pass judgment and say they have failed us. They have failed by any measure you can put up there. Morally, they have failed. Legally, they have failed, violating not only the Constitution, but also the party platform. They don't even look like Republicans anymore. And it started before the session even started with the whole sex scandal and running that guy out of office who certainly did things that were inappropriate and that you wouldn't want your teenage kids knowing about. But he didn't do anything illegal. But they made an example of him and they ran him out of the House when the real scandal was that the previous Speaker of the House tried to cover it up with our money. And they didn't call him to testify. And it went downhill from there, again, with some of the things we've talked about. I'm not going to talk anymore. I need to get our speaker up here. So our theme for today is action, not words. Action, not words. Um, 
the brother of Jesus, after he ascended, really became sort of the de facto leader of the Jerusalem church, of this new Christian movement. Everyone looked to the brother of Jesus. He had a lot of clout, and when he spoke, people listened. We have a book in the New Testament written by the brother of Jesus, and uh, the theme in that is that faith without works is dead. He says in chapter 20 of that letter, What good is it, brothers and sisters, if you claim to have faith, but you don't have any deeds? If you don't do anything to back it up. He says, Can such a faith save anybody? Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And then he goes on to say, well, someone might say, well, I have faith and you've got deeds, so together we make a whole, right? Uh Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. He says, you show me your faith without deeds, I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God? Hey, great, even the demons believe that and are scared of God. But what you say you believe is not relevant without action to match the belief. And there are lots of great passages in the New Testament that talk about this theme. Of course, the uh, writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, we call that the Faith Hall of Fame, the great list of people who lived by faith. And in that chapter, we read that without faith, it is impossible, not possible, to please God without faith. But what is it? What does it look like? And then he explains, faith is what made Abel make a better offering. It's what made Noah warn people and build an ark. It's why Abraham went and why Abraham offered his son. Why Isaac and Jacob invested their goods in all of their sons. It's why Moses' parents hid him from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It's why Moses left Egypt. It's why he applied blood to the door. Because God said, do it, and he did it. It's why his armies march. It's why Rahab spied. And it's why the judges and the prophets conquered kingdoms. And listen to this. Administered justice. The writer says there's not time to list all that the prophets did. And the people of God. And they administered justice. It is elected officials who carry out justice. And you notice... On that whole list, they are action verbs. People left and they marched and they battled. They did things because that's what faith is. It does things. Jesus was preaching and we have some of his remarks recorded in the 12th chapter of Matthew. And he's saying, oh, well, who is my mother and who is my brother? And he points to his disciples. A disciple is someone who follows after the teacher. He points to the people following him. And he says, these are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. He says, whoever what? Does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So when we have people who claim to want to administer justice on our behalf, I want to know what does that justice look like and how are they going to administer it? So day before yesterday, a candidate for the Senate showed up on my doorstep. So I got to have an extra OC PAC interview meeting this week. That was a lot of fun. And so here is that candidate's uh, literature. And right here it says, I am pro-life from the womb to the tomb. This fits with my chosen profession and my beliefs. We must promote laws to protect all, especially our most vulnerable citizens. Great. So what do you think I asked her? What are you going to do? Exactly. And I made it very clear. I said, so would you vote for a bill that would straight up outlaw abortion? Outlaw abortion? Yes. Well, I, I think there's some certain cases where abortion should be allowed. So if you're asking me that, then no, probably not. So... You would just keep the status quo on abortion in Oklahoma statute. Yes, the way I understand it. This is someone who just said she was pro-life. So I submit to you that almost all of them say things just like that on all the topics we care about. I'm pro-life, I'm pro-gun, I'm for less taxes, for smaller government, less regulation, the free market. And then what do they do? Exactly 180 degrees, the opposite is what they do. Their beliefs are dead, according to the Lord. And he will say, depart from me, I didn't know you. 
We'll say, but we did it. But we said we believed it. We wore the ribbons. We had the right campaign slogans. That's what we believed. Yeah, well, so did the demons. And they're going to burn with you if you don't do what you say you believe. And I got news for you. Supporting pregnancy centers is not fighting abortion. It's good. It's helping widows and orphans, which is practicing true religion. It's good. Don't get me wrong. But it is not fighting abortion. And when you ask somebody, hey, what are you doing on abortion? They say, oh, well, we support the... We support the crisis pregnancy center. That's not fighting abortion. They just answered a different question. That's great that they're religious and helping the widows and orphans, but that does not fight abortion. Now let me introduce our speaker. Russell Hunter and I have known each other for more than a decade because it was probably in around 2003 and four that I was beginning to wake up and realized I needed to do more with my life and I needed to pay attention to how I could actually grow the kingdom and authority of God so that His will could be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I began looking for ways to do that that didn't mean working for someone else, sitting behind a desk and crunching numbers so that I could feed my family. Now, I still feed my family, but I needed to do more. One of the ways that I started to do more was I said, I need to fight abortion. And so I got involved with a national organization trying to do that. And I was on this path, right, changing directions. And Russell was on a path, and he was changing directions really about the same, same time frame I was. And our paths crossed like this. In about 2006 or seven, at the campus of Oklahoma University. So we, we first met at that point. But then our paths kept going in different directions, and we didn't see each other anymore. I went on to work with this other organization. Russell eventually founded what we know as, the, as Norman's uh, Abolitionist Society, the Abolitionist Society of Norman. And it's become a model organization for other societies like it all over the country now. So he's a leader of that organization. He's a de facto elder in his church. He's raising his children. He's also a graphic design artist. Uh, so this guy is really smart. When I met him, he was working on a master's degree. Did you ever finish that thing? Finished his master's degree. So in history, political science, very smart guy. So just a couple of years ago, what happened is our life paths are traveling again. And here comes Russell again. And this time we didn't cross. This time we got together and we stayed on the same path. And now we're working very closely together to try and end this evil in Oklahoma. So please put your hands together. Help me welcome Russell Hunter. Well, dang, John. All that really great stuff he said from the Word of God about faith without works being dead. God. Let's just take that and go. I don't need to say anything. That was excellent. I love it. I love it. And, uh, and it does set it up perfectly because um, I, I don't really want to tell you about any credentials or anything like that. But I do want to say, just try to say every time I speak to people, that my main credential, my only real credential is that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I'm a member of the body and bride of Jesus Christ. That's like, that's it. That's the thing. I am part of what God's doing because he redeemed me. And as a repentant follower of Christ, I'm trying to be a part of his body, to edify his body and be a part of what he's doing in the world. And I believe that what he's doing in the world is uh, seeking to establish justice, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and that child sacrifice, abortion, this kind of crown jewel of Satan's kingdom is being destroyed by the people of God. And that this is happening, and what John's talked about how there are these abolitionist societies springing up all over the country, this is happening. And Christians are becoming more bold, more clear, and more emphatic that we should be standing up for the least of these being aborted in our midst and establishing justice for the preborn fatherless. And so I'm a part of that movement. You've probably heard something maybe negative about the abolish human abortion movement, or you don't know anything about it whatsoever. But basically, we're Christians seeking to serve Jesus Christ and bring his gospel, the gospel of his kingdom, into conflict with the culture of death. So, that's where I come from, and that's what I'm speaking on. But the title of the talk here is Abolition, Not Regulation. Um, abolition, not this standard pro-life stuff that... that um, 
the candidate who I'm assuming is not getting the OC back endorsement from what was said. Um, you know, abolition, telling people what you aim to do about abortion, not just your moral opinion, pro-life, pro-choice. Moving beyond a moral opinion, taking action to abolish abortion, to remove it. So, but the subtitle is a little more clear. It's a little longer. Abolishing abortion as murder instead of regulating and reducing it as health care. And that's the reason. I mean, it's, it's kind of befuddling to me that someone would have to speak on this. That I would have to actually like have an opening slide that said, is abortion murder? Like, why in the world? I mean, this is... This is astounding to me, um, but that is the foundational question that we have to start with. And um, I need a podium here, but um, the fact the fact of the matter is, is we don't treat abortion like it's murder. We have a 44-year history, probably longer than that if you really get into the historical nitty-gritty, of not treating abortion as murder. And, and so that's why I have to start here. But just, just so we are beyond any shadow of a doubt, and, and my wife is here. Um, I didn't mention that I'm a father. I've got three children, two that are with us. And uh, sorry, wife, that's my wife's belly. Um, when I had this on my PowerPoint, I had it all sort of tastefully... Um, but this, so you're seeing it off of my cell phone. And I was at an ultrasound, and the reason I'm going to show this is because I just want to make sure that whenever I start lampooning abortion that we all have the right context for this. John, do I just push pr play? It's space bar. Oh, space bar. Fancy. All right, so this is at the OU Medical Center, and that's our midwife. There's a midwife program there, or there was. And we're there looking at our son. This is my son, Ransom. Can you all see it on the screen there? Little wiggling, giggling baby. This is 11 weeks, five days, and we're there, and I'm holding my phone with one hand, and my daughter, she's like two, and she's kind of concerned with this jelly thing on mommy's belly, and, and, it, and if you could hear the vo volume, it's kind of funny, you know, Ransom's touching his nose, and Melian was touching her nose, and we're sitting there, and, and we're, we're there at the medical center, and, um, you know, we see the baby, the baby looks good, and... Uh, Ask some questions. How are you doing? Prenatal vitamins, so on and so forth. All right. Good meeting. Time to go. Do you understand that we could have went downstairs, hopped in our car, got on the interstate, headed to Tulsa or Norman or now Oklahoma City, and had that baby ripped limb from limb? Like, we could have done that. And do you actually understand that if, while we were on the way to doing that, Someone stopped us. Someone prohibited us from butchering this baby. They would be breaking the law because they would be infringing our rights. Do we get that this is what's going on? Now, how could anyone say uh, that ending this child's life isn't murder? This is first trimester abortion, right? This is like when the ultrasounds are the best, you know? This is when a vast majority of the abortions take place at around this stage. Here in Oklahoma and across the nation. Um, of course, if you, if you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just think about this a bit. Um, is, is that human? Is that a human being? Denying that would be crazy. Now, I said I'm a Christian, okay? I come at this from a Christian perspective. That is my neighbor, right? Can anyone deny that? This is my neighbor. I know where he is. I know where he's developing. We've all been there before, have we not? Every single human being here, every single human being everywhere has gone through this stage of development. Jesus Christ, when he entered the womb of a young unmarried woman who was not planning to be with child, went through this stage of development. We've all been here. Our Creator's been here. Right? Clearly alive. If the baby wasn't alive and wasn't developing, we wouldn't even be talking about aborting them. This is post-reproduction, and it is clearly destruction. So, is abortion murder? Of course, 
abortion is murder unless you are scientifically ignorant. Like, you have to be out of your mind, morally and intellectually insane, to say that abortion is not murder. Because you take a birth uh, birth test that says you're pregnant, you know there's a human being there. Because, I don't know how to say this without being vulgar, but... um, Man, I don't know. You know, whenever whenever a, a mother pees on a stick, it, it wouldn't register if it was just her. There's, it's picking up the second person. Okay? Sorry, I don't know. I, I, I had a script. Obviously, I lost it. It's back there somewhere. <laughs> that was not in the script. But when you look at an ultrasound, obviously, my wife doesn't have male anatomy. She doesn't have four arms, four legs, so on and so forth, right? There's another distinct human being there. And the decision, whether you're looking at an ultrasound or a pregnancy stick, or you're just inferring it from missing a cycle or something like that, to intentionally kill them is, by definition, murder. There's a human being there. They're innocent. You've got forethought, and you choose to destroy and terminate their life. This is murder. To think otherwise is to throw philosophy, theology, science, logic, everything in the trash. So, of course, it is murder. I would, um, you know, go so far as to say that it's a particular form of murder, one that's been around from antiquity. In abolitionists, we call it child sacrifice. Like, child sacrifice. Like, why is it, how is it, in a culture where we've got ultrasound technology, advanced medical knowledge, do we butcher 3,000 babies a day. How do we do that? Why? Like, it doesn't make any sense. We're modern, enlightened intellectuals. 50% of the country professes to believe in Jesus Christ and that the Bible is the word of God. I don't know if the stats have changed recently, but there's a lot of Christians here. How in the world do these babies get butchered in our country? Well, because our country is in rebellion to God. And every nation that's been in rebellion to God practices child sacrifice. Look at the word of God throughout the Bible. Even in the great nation of Israel and Judah, they practiced child sacrifice. And the word of God says that they turned their babies over to the fires of Moloch. Like sometimes in the same day that they worshiped God, they would later sacrifice their children. Now, people say, well, don't call it child sacrifice because it's not like there's a demon there or people with horns and doing all this pagan stuff. Well, we don't live in a pagan religious society. We live in a modern, secular, humanist, humanist, scientifically advanced society. And so we've medically perfected child sacrifice, euphemized it, called it abortion. And instead of doing it like this, we do it like this. We set up child sacrifice centers. This is a drawing from Norman, where behind walls, we take our babies away to be butchered. Same thing. There are people there who will help us do that. Clinic escorts. The cops will protect us. Our whole system of government and society is engaged in the practice of child sacrifice. And just like, you know, sorry if any of you guys are from Life Church and you're wondering why the logo there is on the car. Just like in Judah and Israel, Christians engage in this practice every bit as much as non-Christians. In fact, we've so advanced that we created enough chemical abortifacients that there are Christians who pop pills on Saturday night and while they're sitting in the pews worshiping God on Sunday, their babies are being destroyed in their wombs. And so we are in rebellion to God. Um, Not to belabor the point, but um, abortion is child sacrifice. Um... Now someone says, well, no, 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 the reason that we practice child sacrifice is because the United States Supreme Court ruled in Roe v. Wade and gave us this right and so on and so forth, and that is why people feel that they have the right to do this. Yes, but the courts and the legislators and the executives in this country actually just give the people what they want. So all the institutions, the church and the state, are allowing and tolerating the practice of abortion, even though we put up a good front that many of us are opposed to it. Um, are you all tracking with me? Yeah. 
This is a tree. Can y'all can y'all read this all right? Is it big enough up there? Because I want to shift into this, and, and hopefully we can have some conversation, some Q&A, and I won't go too long. But in our modern culture, we have perfected child sacrifice to the point that we've come up with many methods of it. So we've got abortifacients, we've got chemical abortions, surgical abortions, various kinds of surgical abortions, induced labor abortions. We also practice abortion in our stem cell research and in our reproductive technology, in our in vitro fertilization. We create human beings and then we discard them. We create them, we, we experiment on them, we create them, we let them just expire in cryogenic orphanages. And we also practice infanticide in various ways. But these are all the different ways that we practice child sacrifice, and we've just industrialized abortion. But it is all one thing, and it all comes from one root, and that is sin. Right? So I know we're political, we're legislative, and we're, we have an aim to fight abortion in our secular, pluralistic, modern society, but we cannot get we cannot move beyond or outside of this general basic acknowledgement that it's because of sexual morality or adultery pornography the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes a desire for personal peace and affluence that leads to child sacrifice and in a culture advanced like ours we'll come up with a million different ways to practice it and that tree is growing in our nation and that tree is growing and very growing very well Firmly established in Oklahoma. Do not kid yourself. Um, off script here, but do y'all know that Oklahoma is the most pro-life state in the nation? Two years in a row. At least according to Americans United for Life. Most pro-life state in the nation. And um, who do they quote? as the Who's the most pro-life governor in the nation? Does anyone... Mary Fallon. I don't even know why that came in here, but I just printed this out, but I may bring it back up. But, th but this practice of child sacrifice goes on in Oklahoma. We've got five freestanding abortion clinics, and there are probably, God only knows how many doctors who are willing to do them in medical, in, in regular hospitals and so on and so forth. But the reason that it goes on here is because the evil has not been restrained. No one calls it murder. No one treats it as murder. So everyone grows up thinking that it's okay and permissible. They want it. We allow it. And our pro-life legislators in the most pro-life state in Oklahoma regulate it. So um, let, me just, let me just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, there are ways of aborting babies before they even implant today. I think Satan is very proud of that. And we're going to see an uptick on Plan B, IUDs that are basically designed to prevent the implantation of newly conceived image bearers in the wombs of women. And as we focus more and more on just shutting down surgical abortions, we're going to see these proliferating. In the state of Oklahoma, how many abortion clinics are there? I said five freestanding child sacrifice centers, but there are hundreds. There are thousands of abortion providers. Because you can now get abortifacient drugs at Walgreens and Walmart and CVS. People try to put them in... Um, uh, college campus dispensers, buy a Dr. Pepper, buy some Plan B. And of course, if Plan B doesn't work, you can go to the abortion mill, and for $400, you can take a pill that will suffocate and destroy the baby in your womb. No surgery necessary. Lots of abortions happening like this. When pro-lifers boast about the decrease in numbers, it's because there's an increase in this kind of an abortion. Up to 10 weeks, you can do this. And there are certainly ways that it's being done that are not being accounted or uh, accounted for in the ways that surgical abortion numbers are being compiled. Of course, if your baby manages to make it past 10 weeks, you can do surgical abortions with a number of instruments, um, curettes, um, you have suction devices, all sorts of interesting, safe, legal ways to dismember and destroy human beings made in the image of God. And then, of course, there's, you know, if your baby continues to develop and you have to use forceps, um, tongs, that sort of surgical device, you can do that as well. And um, I didn't want to put up actual abortion images because we've been eating. Um, so these are just some drawings that I've done for some material. But all these different ways. All right, so in Oklahoma today, 
while I'm talking and while you guys are eating chips and salsa. This is occurring to your neighbors. Right? The most pro-life state in the nation. So what are we supposed to do about it? What have we been doing about it? Why are we called the most pro-life state in the nation? Is it because we've been trying to abolish abortion? No. It's because we have done a better job regulating abortion than anyone else. Because that's what it means. And I know it's kind of controversial and I bang this drum and I don't even use the word pro-life. I'm actively involved through social media and all sorts of ways to make pro-life a dirty word. And I will fight you to the end of time about that. But what it means to be pro-life, to get the accolades and the awards for being pro-life is to regulate abortion. This thing that I passed out, just if you want to look at it, um, I will, I will tell you the sort of thing. In Oklahoma, and, and keep in mind, are we treating abortion as murder? Are we calling it murder? Or are we treating it as murder? In Oklahoma, we have passed laws, you know, the kind of laws that get you a rose on rose day, saying that before you kill your baby, you have to wait 72 hours. Now, if I have a tooth problem, I have to set up an appointment. Generally, I've got to wait 72 hours or more to go get it fixed, right? But whenever we kill our babies, pro-life legislators have said, before you kill a baby, you've got to wait 72 hours. Um, we've done things like, uh, uh, you know, we've passed legislation saying that before a mother has her baby butchered, she must be given the option to choose to listen to a heartbeat. Or to choose to look at an ultrasound. The pro-lifers in Oklahoma have teamed up with the abortionist and required the abortionist to, if he's going to have a website or she's going to have a website, she must include a link to a state-created and sponsored website encouraging the woman to choose life. The abortionist in Oklahoma, because of the pro-life legislators, has to post, post a sign inside of his abortion mill saying that the woman has a choice and she cannot be coerced or forced into an abortion. On and on and on. Things like this. Just recently, I think it was... Yeah, John, you were asking me about this. HB 1703 was signed into law last Friday by Bloody Mary. And it's called the Choosing Childbirth Act. And this is a bill saying that it's important that we kind of come up with a um, line in the budget to fund crisis pregnancy centers, which are good, and I agree with John, but these are essentially make-a-good-choice clinics. In a nation that practices child sacrifice, we will have child sacrifice centers, and we will have crisis pregnancy centers, and we let people choose. This is not treating abortion as murder. This is treating abortion as choice, and every bit of pro-life legislation. I believe when I made this pamphlet, this is a year old now, there were 20 solid laws that were, and then you can kill a baby laws. Not one in the history of the pro-life legislature in Oklahoma, not one time have they ever passed or even really sort of progressed through the House or the Senate any bill calling abortion murder, treating abortion murder, and seeking to outright abolish it. It's all been regulation. I think we all kind of know this. But just in case. Pro-life governor. Pro-life lieutenant governor. Right? Pro-life attorney general. Pro-tem, pro-life. I don't know if it's changed in the past year. When I read the, I don't know, who is the lieutenant governor now? Oh, yeah? I thought he recused himself. That would look good on a bumper sticker. Someone note that. Um, a dominated, I mean, this is, this is the elephant in the room, all right? The Senate and the House and all the people in power claim to be pro-life. And I want to submit that they are. They are pro-lifers. The governor is a pro-lifer. You know what they're not? They're not abolitionists. They regulate abortion. A lot of them have good hearts and good motives. 
going back for 40 years. The reason they've sought to regulate abortion is because in their minds, abortion is legal, that'll never change, and so all we can do is put Band-Aids on it. We need to regulate this process in order to reduce it. We need to make it safe, and we need to make it more rare. And if you all recall back Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, the statement of, of the pro-choice movement, we want to make abortion safe, legal, and rare. If you're talking about, thanks John, if you are talking about what we are doing, that is the motto of the pro-life movement. They try to make abortion safe. They try to make it more rare because they just accept the fact that it's legal. So what is the difference between abolition and regulation moving forward so we can think about what we need to do um, in Oklahoma, in everywhere in the nation? The reason I have a tree isn't just because I like to draw crazy things. It's because I want people to understand what a regulationist mindset is, a pro-life mindset is, and how radically different it is from an abolitionist mindset. The regulationist looks at this tree and looks at his weapon and says, I've got some shears. And he goes to lop off one of the branches. He says, like we passed in Oklahoma a 20-week ban, a dismemberment ban. Go read the language. It literally says in the language, we're going to ban dismemberment abortions with forceps, comma, because there are all sorts of other ways to dismember babies that don't require forceps, and those will remain legal. It's nonsense, but in their minds, they chop off a branch They turn around, they get before their constituents, their campaign contributors, their crisis pregnancy center banquet people, and they say, I'm pro-life, I chopped off this branch, but of course, some other branch grew in its place. So famously, we abolished partial birth abortion, right? Did it affect late-term abortion? No. In the language for that, it actually said there are other forms of aborting late-term babies and induced labor abortion. So if you look at it, the partial birth branch is gone, but induced labor abortion. Because it's not fighting abortion in and of itself. They all grow from one tree. That's what the abolitionist does. It says, put away your shears, pick up an axe, and lay it to the root. The only way that you can take out this whole thing is if you go for abortion in and of itself. So how does that influence OCPAC? How does that influence uh, those who not only think abortion is murder, but want to treat abortion as murder, believe that the only real role of good government is to restrain evil, to be a terror to those who do evil, to protect the innocent. How do we move to a place where we actually abolish abortion? Well, this is, this is maybe the one thing, you know, come let us reason together. This is for your consideration. That in a country, in a nation where we have ultrasound technology, where we have our knowledge, where you have this many Christians, how do you keep something so monstrous and so evil like abortion legal? I'm going to sound like a conspiracy theorist. Well, you control the opposition. The key to keeping abortion legal, especially in a state dominated by pro-lifers, is a never-ending stream of incremental pro-life victories. A constant pruning of the tree. Never laying the axe to the root. But you can do this and everyone can go home and say that they're pro-life. You can run as a pro-lifer. That is what we have to change. And I'm super stoked that John Mishner is letting me yell about this in Mama Roja. Thanks, Mama Roja. But seriously, we have to... No longer, I know this is a conservative political action committee. We have to no longer, as Republicans, as conservatives, as Christians, support pro-lifers. Because pro-lifers regulate abortion. That's what the history is. All evidence leads to that. We don't need a pro-life governor. We need an abolitionist to run against a pro-life governor. Because pro-life governors, what do they do? We know what they do. They keep abortion legal. So, I'm I'm about done. John's like, you are done. (laughs) 
I think John's been talking about this. I think Matt Chuella has been talking about this. But, guys, we got to get serious. You guys are kind of the movers and the shakers. You know, y'all are the people who actually call legislators. Y'all are the people who actually donate and actually do these things, right? We're going to be coming up to, we're going to, be coming up to a governor's race. I don't know how many people are, four or five people are going to be saying, I'm the governor. We don't need to be asking them if they're pro-life. We need to be asking them if they're abolitionist. We don't need to rally behind any magistrate who's going to say, oh yeah, whenever a bill comes to my desk, I'll sign it if it doesn't uproot the tree. I'll sign it if it just lofts off a branch because I would really love to run as a pro-lifer in the future. We need to destroy that mentality. And I think that OCPAC is definitely moving in that direction. And I'm done. Cool. Wave at me if you have a question. Nobody's waving. Russell, in two minutes, can well, you give Charlie's us... Charlie's waving. While I'm walking over there, give us the two-minute rendition of Moses fighting incrementalism. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, if I actually say to my script, this, this is an age-old debate, okay? And then, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you set me up for this because, okay, do you all know Exodus, Moses, Pharaoh, right? What was the key to keeping the Israelites in bondage? Regulation, incrementalism. So Moses shows up, says, let my people go. Pharaoh's like, I don't even know your God, whatever. Nile turns to blood, so on and so forth. Okay, okay, so here's the deal. Get Moses and Aaron back in here because this is kind of crazy. My magicians can't turn dust into gnats. We need to have Moses back in. So Pharaoh has him back in. This is the magistrate. This is the king of Egypt. And he says, all right, Moses, here's the deal. You guys can go for three days, the men. Moses says, uh, no, you don't, I don't think you understand. We're leaving. Rejects the deal. The best that he can get. Goes off, more plagues. You know what I'm saying? Eventually, Pharaoh says, okay, come back in. Says, you can go and your women can go. But your children have to stay. Moses rejects the deal. A few, few plagues later, you can go, your children can go, and you guys can just go, but you can't take your animals with you. And by this time, Moses is the full-blown abolitionist, totally emboldened, looks at him and says, not a hoof will remain in Egypt. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. This is abolitionism coming into full-blown conflict with this sort of like incremental deal-making thing. So whenever legislators put forward bills like, oh, we're going to ban this amount of abortion, pro-lifers, the people, us, we actually uh, clamor to get the best that we can get. And of course, it never, never succeeds. Um, we need to care as much about our pre-born neighbors as Moses cared about the animals of the Israelite slaves. Oh, wait. I just want to say one thing. You see this. You do see this from Moses. Whenever the prophets stood up, and they always talked about Moses and the exploits that he did, so on and so forth. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they always stand up and they're like, woe to those who pass iniquitous decrees, who modify the law of God in order to make the fatherless pray. Woe to those who go with the multitude to do evil, who call a little, a little evil good, so on and so forth. This is who we are as the people of God. We are not to compromise with it, because compromise with child sacrifice or any evil is a way to keeping it around. It's like pruning a tree. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, we had the resolution this year right. uh, establishing um, abortion as murder. Leading up to that, the noise I heard in the news... Um, was that this was a waste of time. And of course, the Oklahoma is more than happy to publish and, and editorialize on anything like that mm -hmm. uh, if it's not about money for the Oklahoma, in my estimation. But uh, so when we get down to the time that we actually vote and anticipated it consumed lots of time with debate from the Democrats, it was boom, boom, over, and that was it. But it was not a recorded vote. Right. Um, I'm wondering if there was a deal uh, involved that uh, we won't do a recorded vote on this because you can't hold anybody accountable on it now. We can't use this on the index right? Uh, because it's not a recorded vote. And I'm wondering if there was a deal made, okay, uh, cut down on the, the debate time and stuff like that. We'll go ahead and pass it and... and uh, 
And, and so what's your, what's your thought on that? So obviously I'm not there, but I definitely think the same thing. There were two House resolutions this year dealing with abortion. The first was uh, 1001, and that was a resolution from the pro-lifers that said, we, we just want, we're resolved to express the significance of Rose Day. <laughs> right? Like, let's make a resolution to continue to give roses to people who regulate abortion. Right? We've already done this this year. We've already done this this year, referring to that. This one, House Resolution 1004, is a, is, it shows that there's a shift in language and focus. Abortion is murder. All state officials should be directed to stop it. And the judges should get out of it, right? So it's good. Of course, it does set them up to be hypocrites. Total hypocrites. Well, like, yeah, but the House, the People's House, has resolved to do this. It did pass. So it should be the sort of thing. Now, but if we want to look, okay, so I don't know these numbers, but Justin Humphreys put forward a bill early in the legislative session saying that abortions need to, uh, it, you know, of course it's celebrated as a pro-life bill, but the, the, the father needs to be a part of the choice. And the pro-choicers lampooned him because he called women incubators or whatever, and um, you know the bill didn't go anywhere, right? Uh, George Fott put forward a bill saying if you're going to abort a baby, you can't abort a baby because they have Down syndrome, right? So this sort of like Down syndrome selection, abortion sort of things. Pro-choice has also lampooned that, of course. But here's the deal, and this is a good thing. On social media, among the young, thinking abolitionists and pro-lifers who've been influenced by abolitionists or just the spirit of God or whatever, they're making fun of those bills too, no offense to George or Humphreys, I don't know them, but when those bills were put forward, they're like, wait a second, what about like Joe Silk's Senate bill last year, 1118, abortion is murder, it should be criminalized and abolished, first degree homicide. What about that sort of thing? Something like, if you're going to take your Down syndrome baby to be butchered and they say, are you butchering your baby because of Down syndrome? You say, no, just because I don't want a baby. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Stupid. They were making fun of this thing. That the father had to be in on the decision to sacrifice the child. They were making fun of these things. When we move it to abortion is murder, even in resolutions, and the people hold them to that, when we do that, it becomes harder and harder for these legislators to pretend. I imagine that an index would actually give someone an A grade for being pro-life. Oh, you said that you like roses? Oh, sweet. A, you're a pro-lifer. You said you wanted money from National Right to Life organizations? A. Tony Lowinger quoted you in some LifeSite news article? You get an A. Oh, abolitionist, you get an F. And that voters, when they start seeing the distinction, will say, I don't want a man with shears. I want a man with an axe. Ooh. I don't vote for A-plus pro-lifers. I vote for Pause A, there. abolitionists. Uh, Russell, I don't know if this is a question, but it's probably a statement, but I would you comment on it. First of all, I want to thank you because you personally have helped me to be able to verbalize what I've always believed. And I mean that. Uh, the whole idea of abolition, though we all understand it, has not been used enough for us to embrace it. I am finding among sincere believers that I'm talking to, and a lot of them, they immediately embrace this once they understand it. Totally. So I think that a lot of people who call themselves pro-life and have for years just didn't understand fully the whole concept. And once they've had it explained to them, they immediately shift. I was talking to a pastor Saturday night in Sand Springs. And he's been a pro-lifer since Roe v. Wade. I mean, you encounter these people all the time, I know. He immediately shifted and embraced the abolitionist idea just almost instantaneously. Okay, so here's my point. I, I think part of it is semantic and education. I think there are a lot of sincere believers who are with you. They just don't know they're with you. When I say you, I simply mean the abolitionist yeah, the concept idea. and movement. But do you not think that one of the reasons why we're bound up here is not because people don't truly want to end abortion. Now, I realize the politicians probably don't. But the, but the average person does. I, I come across few people that say, well, I'd like for us just to kind of slow it down. No, everybody I come into contact with says, stop it. It's terrible. Okay, 
But don't you think a big part of the problem is our misunderstanding of the authority of the federal government and the Supreme Court? I think people are vapor locked thinking, well, the Supreme Court says it's legal. There's nothing we can do about it. So for me, this is a twofold fight. It's a moral fight, and I think you would agree with that. But I think it's also a sovereignty fight because we have subjugated ourselves to the kingmakers and immoral lawmakers in Washington, D.C., and we've brainwashed ourselves into believing we, it has to be legal because it's legal. It isn't. We all know that. But the Supreme Court says it's legal. And until we can get people to understand both the immorality of it, I'm with you all the way, but also that we're going to have to say no. We're going to have to say no to Washington. And I just don't think the politicians, well, I don't think the politicians are going to be willing to do that. The people are going to have to make them do it. So anyway, I don't want to preach. But well, well, the thing is, is if, if I were given an hour long, the second half would basically be about defying tyrants in every instance where you have. So the word of God is actually full of people standing up for justice and mercy, rescuing children even. The Hebrew midwives, what are they doing? They're defying the orders, the lawful decrees of Pharaoh. Right? The, the Magi who are working with Herod to find the, the king. What are they? They Oh, I think he went that way. I mean, they're, they're just constantly defying. There is going to be a place for biblical obedience. Secularists call civil disobedience or whatever. But there's going to be a place for that. There's going to be defiance. And I, would, and I would totally agree. But there's this sort of mindset thing that's going on that I think you nail perfectly. And that is that everyone is basically subservient in a sort of sense to, well, the Supreme Court said this. Now, if you look at the abolition of slavery, even all the way back then, that's what they're saying. But the Supreme Court said, 1857, Dred Scott, fugitive slaves, the Constitution is a slave abetting document, right? What are the abolitionists doing? They're running around burning the Constitution. I, I mean, I asked Mama Roja if I could do that. They were like, no, 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 you can't do it. But, but they're, I mean, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, they're standing up and they're saying, are we talking about the Supreme Court or the Supreme Lawgiver, right? And the people of God, which there is a vast majority of us um, in, this, in this state, there's a majority in this state, but there is certainly a lot in a lot of other states, need to start, you know, defying tyrants, defying Pharaoh. Whenever Pharaoh says, well, how about this? We say, how about you take a hike? The Supreme Court needs to be considered a joke. They're wicked. They make iniquitous decrees. Like if I had them memorized, I'd tell you all the previous opinions that are just completely wrong. And we all know that they're fallible. And yet, we sort of just sort of couch out. But I, I want to agree with the first part. The standard normal Christian. I mean the Bible-believing, like follower of Jesus Christ Christian that I talk to, who's never heard about abolitionism being applied to um, child sacrifice... When I tell them about that, they're like, well, yeah, that's, that's what I've always meant by pro-life. I was like, well, that's not what you've been given. Whenever you go, I'm going to go do something pro-life, and you go to the Capitol and you, get your, you bring your sign, it's never been for what you believe. It's always been for a 20-week ban. So you've got people preaching in their pulpits, life begins at conception, and then marching down to the Capitol and holding signs about 20 weeks, 140 days after life begins. So it is the leaders that I think are, I'm going to say another uncouth thing, um, sucking on the teat of the system, whether in government, the leaven of Herod, or within the institutional church, the leaven of the Pharisees, who are part of this system, keeping everything the way it is, and those leaders are saying, yeah, the tree's bad, we're against the tree, pick up the shears. Pick up the shears, pick up the shears, pick up the shears. And when abolitionists come along and say, uh, the tree's wicked and we're under the judgment of God, let's chop this thing down, the regular pro-lifer doesn't go, you're out of your mind. The regular pro-lifer is like, hey, that's great. And then the leader's like, no, 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 come here. They're a cult. <laughs> those people that are talking about the acts and the gospel, those Christian people that are trying to abolish abortion, they're a cultist. They're extremists. They're weird. They think that the whole nation needs to repent, churches included. Okay, we're after 1 o'clock, and he gives long answers. So we're going to do just one more question. Unless I nail it short. One, uh, one thing we have on our side, when you were telling your story about your taking your wife to the abortion clinic after being, all you had to do was basically say, if a drunk driver would have come and run into you and killed your wife, 
he would have then been accused of double murder. And so we have this inconsistency, but we have to, we can use that argument to basically tell people, okay, if it's wrong to murder uh, a baby when it's being killed in an auto accident, why is it not wrong for it to be done in, a, in an abortion clinic? And I think we have that argument, and I think a lot of people are inconsistent because they would say, oh yeah, he deserves to uh, be accused of a double murder. Uh, whereas on the, if you'd gone on the abortion clinic, nobody would have had a problem. Because abortion is not legal in practice in this country because people don't believe that there's a human there or a life or anything like that. No one believes that. They're all lying. That's all rhetoric. Roe v. Wade didn't say the reason you can have an abortion is because they're not a person. Hillary Clinton in her campaign last year didn't say that unborn persons... She didn't say that we were persons. They, she said unborn persons do not have constitutional rights. It's all window dressing. The reality is, is there's a positive right to choose whether or not you will terminate a child. And that's, that's why the abolitionist focuses on that right instead of, because that is hypocrisy. That is a total flipped around situation. And I think we can exploit that argument. But we need to be bold about it. And we need to like, we just need to deal with the fact that the lady who did, the lady who gave birth, uh, who assisted us, I delivered ransom, but the previous child on, on accident, I'm not a doctor, it just kind of happened. I was freaked out. I kept my calm. I didn't pass out. But my previous child, Melian, was delivered by someone who monitors the entire process. But she's a pro-abort. We didn't find this out till later, but our midwife was pro-abortion. She's seen it. It's not an education problem. It really isn't. The people who, like, oh, you've got to show the abortion images and that's going to so solve it. No, you know who sees abortion images every day? Abortionists, abortion workers. We all know it's a human being. We have to call it what it is, the right to murder, and abolish it as murder. Any deviation from that, lost cause, failure. Thank the man. So now I get to exercise my right to just tell a quick story, but I'm having Charlie come up to lead us in prayer, so when he's standing here, it'll make me talk fast. I was at a family gathering a few weeks ago. Everyone there is, is a very a professing, conservative Christian, and as soon as they found out what I did for a living as a minister trying to stop abortion, I, immediately people had questions. And so here in this gathering of conservative Christians and family members, Two of them got right up in my grill and wanted to know how I could make that case from Scripture. And then they weren't listening to reason. Folks, I have been debating, discussing, having dialogue, and making arguments for more than a decade now. And Russell's right. It's not about the arguments. We win on the arguments. They're not listening. La, 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 la. They're full of sin and selfishness. They want it their way and they don't want anything getting in the way, including another innocent human being. And this is the, this is what is infected. It's the disease that's infected our entire culture. We're rejecting God. We want it man's way, not God's way. And, it, and abortion is one of the worst symptoms, but it's what's infecting our, our lawmakers as well and our public officials, and our pastors, and our elders, and our preachers, and our teachers. We want what we want. We want it now, and nothing's getting in the way. And until we are ready to humble ourselves and say, no, God, your way, it's not going to change. They will take anything out of the way of what they want when a person is that selfish, even if it's another human being. So thanks for your attention today. We'll be here again next week. Charlie, if you would, please. Let's go to the Lord here. Uh, Father, this has been a, a very sober uh, time here today, and we thank you for this brother bringing this message, challenging our hearts. I just pray that, Lord, we would uh, go out of here today with uh, courage and conviction in our hearts to do the right thing. Uh, Father, we just pray that your spirit would move across the people of this state that profess to be yours yet have a tremendous heart problem, whether that be a divided heart, or they might be serving you with part of their heart, serving their own lust, their flesh, and the world with the other part of their heart. Lord, deal with them. Uh, bring them to a whole heart service toward you. 
and those that are truly yours that are serving you with a whole heart, Lord. I pray, God, that you would, your spirit would move upon their hearts and minds and prepare them to hear this message, Lord, and put within them a desire to take a stand and to have the courage to stand for truth, to stand for life. Truly, this is a sin that brings a curse upon this state that holds this state down, the people down in this state because we're not walking in your purposes and your will. So I just pray, God, you'd begin preparing the hearts and minds of everybody and send out many, many more people with this message, Lord, that we would have an opportunity to repent, come to the truth and come to the light and take a stand for your truth and for life and stop this evil of murdering the most innocent among us. Father, for those that have already been involved and supported this, Lord, they can be forgiven. And I pray they would understand that and that others would lead them and guide them and make them true warriors once they've repented of that and been healed of that. True warriors to be those that would work to abolish abortion, not regulate it. Thank you for that message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.